today I'm talking about the Mission Impossible movies, and I'm going to be ranking them from my favorites. Um, I just saw Dead Reckoning not too long ago. It was about two or three weeks, uh, actually two or three months ago, um, back when it was still in the theaters. It didn't do that well theatrically, um, mainly because the hype for Barbie kind of steamrolled it, and most people decided. I think there was a lot of movies that came out this summer, um, and if you saw Across the Spider-Verse, you know, if you're like me and you have movie pass, you see a lot of movies every month. I think a lot of people that decided to see Across the Spider-Verse went on to see Barbie, and especially people with families couldn't really afford to see a bunch of movies. Because there was a lot of them, so you kind of had to pick and choose. I mean, Transformers had just come out with the movie, Flash had just dropped, Cross the Spider-Verse had just dropped, and then you got Mission Impossible next to Indiana Jones waiting for Barbie and Oppenheimer to come out. So it was kind of a perfect storm that didn't allow Dead Reckoning Mission Impossible to do very well. Um, if it was coming out now, I feel like it would have done a lot better in September. But, you know, it was a summer blockbuster. But sometimes there's only so much competition you can really go through. So anyway... Now I'm talking about Mission Impossible. I'm going to rank my favorite Mission Impossible movies and also do a bit of a review of Dead Reckoning. So for me at number seven for Mission Impossible comes Mission Impossible number two. Um, I think this is definitely the worst one by far. Um, and if I had been watching, this is the only one I'd say that's like really not good. Um, if I had been watching the Mission Impossible franchise, like when it had first come out, because the first movie came out in 96. I wasn't even born yet. This one didn't come out until I think it was like 99 or 2000. If I was trying to like get into the franchise, this movie probably would have dropped me out of it um, because it was just compared to the first one, especially it just kind of was everything that you don't want a movie to be. I mean, the Tom Cruise did a good job, but it's like, you know, they still had the damsel in distress throughout the entire movie, a bunch of weird off-putting jokes throughout it. She did good, but it was just, it was just odd. If it, it's, it's hard to watch that movie now because things have changed so differently, like in 2020, um, because like if that kind of, if that movie came out now, the same way that it did, it probably would have been lambasted. And again, it's not like it was like gross or weird or anything like that. It just, it just kind of fed into a lot of stuff that we've already seen. And um, I didn't really get a whole lot of chemistry between Tom Cruise and the main act. It just kind of felt like she's attractive. Tom Cruise is attractive. They go together. Done. Um, we didn't really get to explore a lot of personality, a lot of depth. Um, and that's just kind of the movie. And then the fight scene at the end, it was a lot of cheesy camera angles. It feels sort of like there was a lot of cheesy stuff going on in there. Um, and it, it just doesn't really do it. That's a movie I probably will not, will not see again. Um, so that's the lowest ranking one. And again, to me, that's the only one that's really, I would say, bad or not good. Next one I have is actually Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. And this is where I think they get good. I mean, a lot of the uh, Mission Impossible movies I do find good. Um, this one, I liked it. I just don't think it really stands out against all of them because... I hadn't watched, I think that this is the first one I've seen, Ghost Protocol, and then I went back and I watched them all in order to get ready for Dead Reckoning before it came out, and this one, it really just kind of blends in. There's not like a lot of standout performances, there's not really a lot of standout action sequences, it's just a solid, really good action spy movie. Um, I think having Jeremy Renner in the franchise was a good call, because he, he plays his role very well. Um, it's just, it's just kind of there. It's hard to explain. It had a good plot, it had a good, good everything. It just doesn't really stand out to me. It doesn't really stand out. Um, but a very solid movie, nonetheless. Next at number five, we have Mission Impossible, and this is the one that kickstarted it all. Um, and this is one of those franchises. I feel like for a lot of franchises, the first movie is always the best, and you can never really top it. Um, like that's the case of. Transformers. I mean, they're on number six or seven now, and none of them have come close to me, any spinoff or anything, to topping the first one. The first one is just the best one, and it always will be. Um, this one is where, but for Mission Impossible, for the most part, the movies progressively get better. Almost every single time, they get better. Um, and the, this first one, though, Mission Impossible, it was, it was, 
it came out in 96 and um rewatching it it's funny it came out in 96 and it's funny because i saw it right after i had just rewatched the transformers franchise and um i didn't realize john voight was in this movie and um he plays a very very interesting role in this one and i didn't realize that this is where the masks like the masks have been around since the first mission impossible movie um so when people see them done over and over again i mean it's like well it's been working for a long time so anyway um i i thought it was really cool watching how they had to like figure everything out and how his team betrayed him it, it felt like we were solving a puzzle together with tom cruise um, and I feel like that was a very good place to put his character into. And I feel like the person that, like, throughout the movie, I kind of thought that John Voight's character was dead, which made me very surprised because, like, I knew how big of an actor he was. And so for him to be dead already was very surprising. And then the character that we were kind of anticipating to be the antagonist, it actually had a good twist. And so, and again, my first time seeing it was 20-something years after it had come out. So imagine how good of a twist that would have been back when it came out. Um, and it's surprising that it took them so long to make a sequel and then the next one and then the next one. They've been spread out over a large period of time. Um, but yeah, no, I, th I think it was a very good movie. Um, and it really, this had more of the, it was a lot more detective work than I would say spy work. It felt like we were figuring things out, putting a puzzle together. And I feel like none of the other movies really have that. Like they kind of do, but it's more about globetrotting spy action than it is like putting together a puzzle. And so I think that one, that's where this one in particular excels. Next, I have Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Um, Rogue Nation was really good because I liked what they did with um, the main villain. Um, and Re uh, Rebecca Ferguson played a good character in this one. Um, I like what they did with her character. It feels like, you know, each Mission Impossible movie, they kind of trade out a female character in each one. And it's like, which one exactly is supposed to be like Tom Cruise's love interest or whatever. It's like, I don't know. It's very hard to like follow and keep track of, um, or like, which one are you rooting for? But Rebecca Ferguson made a very good character to root for, um, being British intelligence. It's kind of being used by the MI6, but she still needs to take down, um, this guy who runs this rogue nation, the syndicate, Solomon. Um, I want to say Solomon Grundy, but I know that's not his name. Anyway, um, Solomon, you know, is the main villain, and I feel like watching him, it was kind of brutal watching him be there when Tom Cruise got the call for his next mission, um, and watching him kill that messenger. Like, that was, I think that let it snow exactly what kind of movie we were in, and how intense this movie was going to be, and so that really set the tone for everything. But it was a very good film. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think it set up the rest of the movies really well. Next one I have is Mission Impossible number three. And so Mission Impossible three, this one was directed by J.J. Abrams. And dare I say, this one definitely resurrected the franchise. I think after Mission Impossible two, people weren't really interested in seeing it go forward, um, just because two probably just didn't seem that interesting to them after that. Um, like I said, the main character in two, she pretty much like they just use her to like seduce this guy. It's like, I, you know, it's just lame. I think that's the only way to describe it. Um, but three, um, JJ Abrams directs it and he does a dynamite job with the action, the shot sequences, you know, there's still a MacGuffin and rabbit's foot. Um, but I think Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, rest in peace to Philip Seymour Hoffman, but he did an excellent job playing the villain because he was just ruthless and we did not like him from the get-go. Which sometimes you want to have your villains have a little bit of, you know, uh, the right word for it. Yeah, a little bit of sympathy or empathy for them, understand what they're going through. But overall, I think J.J. Abrams was absolutely dynamite in this role. Um, I think J.J. Abrams absolutely directed a fantastic movie. Sorry. Um, the addition of Simon Pegg, who went on to become a mainstay, was um, a great addition. And I didn't realize that Ving Rhames had been with the Mission Impossible franchise since the very beginning. And so um, I think J.J. Abrams is a fantastic director. 
Um, I love what he did with the Star Trek franchise, and I thought he did a great job with Star Wars Force Awakens. I think his only blemish is really the rise of Skywalker, and I think he was still just trying to undo what happened with The Last Jedi. But anyway, that's Star Wars. Star Wars, very different kind of movie. But for this one, I think um, Tom Cruise and J.J. Abrams showed great chemistry, and I think the action pieces worked together. J.J. Abrams got Maggie Q in this movie, who is another phenomenal actress. Um, I know her mainly from Designated Survivor, but she was also in Nikita. And a couple other really good properties. Um, I thought she was a fantastic addition to this movie. And it felt like it was a very cohesive storyline. Um, it worked together really well. I think even like the Michelle Monaghan just kind of being Tom Cruise's wife and then him having to be called back into the field. Um, it kind of shows where his head's at. Um, I love the way that he, you know, he trained that other agent. It kind of made it feel even more brutal when he trained that other agent and then she died in front of him. Like that was just, especially because we got the flashbacks of them training, that just hit on another level. Um, and like he got her out of there and she still died. You know, that it was just, it was very powerful. Um, and I think they really, J.J. Abrams did a really good job of testing Tom Cruise's character to the limit, testing Ethan to the limit of what he was willing to do, and the fact that he had to be stopped from going too far, and the fact that him having to be stopped from going too far is what allowed the villain to go too far and attack his wife. So it's just, it was, it was a really brilliantly done movie. Well, it was a very good done movie. I, I can't really use the word brilliant. But it was really good. Um, really loved Mission Impossible 3. And um, yeah, I wish J.J. Abrams got a chance to direct more of them. Um, I think Christopher Quarry is a slightly better fit for Tom Cruise. I think they do work together really well. But um, I would love to see J.J. Abrams and Tom Cruise do something else. Honestly, I would have loved to see J.J. Abrams direct a Green Lantern movie that had Chris Pine playing Hal Jordan and Ving Rhames playing Kilowog. But, you know, that's a whole nother tangent to get off on um but other way fantastic movie great job um and yeah one of the top ones for me for mission impossible at number two we have fallout mission impossible fallout um this one i thoroughly liked because um i think not only did henry cavill he was a very welcome addition to the franchise um i think he did a great job playing his role um angela bassett of course was dynamite in her role as that CIA director. I think it was interesting because they did the reveal of him being a double agent pretty early on. Um and he still ended up being like and like I like how Christopher Quarry really made this a sequel because most of the Mission Impossible movies kind of finish and then keep going. And they finish one storyline and then move on to the next one. And so when Christopher McQuarrie came into the franchise for Rogue Nation, the way he directed Fallout and had the storyline continue and pick up showed that he had a greater vision. You know, he wanted this to be a sequel. Um, and so being able to see that play out and seeing the way that it all interacted was really good. Um, and so with Christopher McQuarrie being the first director to return to the franchise, he was able to really continue to build the story of Solomon Lane, who was the main villain of um, Ghost. He was the main villain of Rogue Nation, sorry, and really build the story of Solomon Lane. And now this group of the syndicate has reorganized into the Apostles, trying to get plutonium cores from this guy named John Lark. Um, Vanessa Kirby makes another ex excellent addition to the franchise. Um, really excited and hoping that she's going to play Sue Storm. But anyway, that's off on another topic. Um, so yeah, Christopher McQuarrie did an excellent job with Fallout, and like I said, Henry Cavill's becoming a secret agent, I, a double agent, it wasn't the most surprising reveal, um, it wasn't like, you know, that, I don't know, earth shattering, um, but I think, you know, in the previews and everything, they did a good job of keeping him, um, grounded, and seeming like, like, he seemed like more of a threat when he became a double agent if that makes sense. I think he was very careful in the movie and the way that Christopher McQuarrie did his character. 
he made sure that even though he thought he was better than Ethan Hunt, he made it look like he wasn't as good as Ethan Hunt, if that makes sense. Like, I think all those mistakes, slight mishaps, all of those things, those were done on purpose. So that way, Ethan Hunt would think that his character, who turned out to be John Lark, turns that, that he wasn't as much of a threat, if that makes sense. He was underestimated in that way because it's like, well, this guy can't even skydive. There's no way he could be a double agent. And it's not like they were having that conscious thought, but you know what I mean? It kind of like, he made sure that he was seemed lower than Ethan Hunt, even though he was acting like, yeah, I'm better than Ethan Hunt. It was like, and I thought that was very cool because then once he became the double agent, you could see how evenly matched they actually were because now he's turning it on. Now he's turning on, you know, the fighting ability, like all that stuff. And now it's like, oh, wow, these guys are actually kind of on the same playing field, you know, as far as skill goes. Um, so I thought that was a, it's a subtle, a really subtle thing. Um, but I think that's what really sold the whole double agent narrative that they were going for in this movie. Um, so I think it was a very good film. Um, yeah, yeah, it's right up there as um, Fallout. And I look forward to seeing, I was really looking forward after seeing this movie, I was really looking forward to seeing what gets builded on. And I think um, for Christian, for Macquarie, this is the first movie that feels like it ties in every single thread that was ever opened by the Mission Impossible franchise, including his wife being Michelle Monaghan. And um, I thought it was interesting because it's like it's almost like at the end they turned. I didn't realize that like Michelle Monaghan's character divorced from him and was with somebody else. Um, and I guess they did that to keep her safe, which does make sense. Actually, it's actually not that, um, I don't know if the word is sad, but it does make sense. However, it was done very tastefully. Um, I think that's the right word for it. It was done very tastefully, and now it seems like Rebecca Ferguson is going to be the new in love interest in Is the Faust. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's why Mission Impossible Fallout is my number two on the Mission Impossible movies. Real quick to add in, um, on Mission Impossible 3, even at the end when he's like going to rescue her, and like that frantic scene where like she's got to help him stop these guys while he's dying and she has no idea that her husband is the secret agent. The way that J.J. Abrams had it shot with the jump cuts and like the twitchiness of the scenes, it was really good because it made the audience like we felt like she did. It was a very anxious, not even anxious. Um, there's a word better than anxious that I'm looking for, but I can't think of right now. But it made us feel what she was feeling like nervous, like completely distraught and the way that he shot those scenes added to that effect and I thought that was a phenomenal job on J.J. Abrams part. However for my number one Mission Impossible movie I actually have to go with the one that just came out and that is Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. Um, I'm not sure if it's already on streaming I gotta check because I would love to see it again but it was a fantastic movie. Um, I remember watching it and being like man I wish more people could have seen this in theaters. Um, I wish more people could have seen this in, I wish it had gotten more love, I guess is the right word for it. Um, spoilers coming out for it, because again, this is a review of it, but I am going to spoil it as I talk about how good it was. Again, Christopher McQuarrie keeps all those characters from Mission Impossible going on into this storyline. I think the only one that doesn't return is Michelle Monaghan, but then again, that's because he wrapped up her storyline in the other movie. Um, and it's interesting because the whole movie, they're fighting this AI virus, but some people want to control it. Some people want to destroy it. And um, I love Haley Atwell as an actress. I think that's partly what's, you know, making this movie seem better to me because when you really like an actress or an actor, it can make something be a lot better just because you really like them. You're a fan of them. You know, that's just the way that it works. I think she was a great addition to the franchise. And I'm surprised at how much the movie centered in on her. Like, she was kind of, I thought she was just going to kind of be a side character. But really, again, spoilers alert. Spoilers alert. She became the focus of the movie. The entire movie was kind of revolving around her character and what was happening as a direct result of her actions. And Rebecca Ferguson's character, Isla Faust, was more of a side character. Um, and it kind of shows that I think they're, again, 
bringing another love interest into Tom Cruise's life of Haley Atwell. And she's going to end up playing a pretty big role in the last one, which was kind of surprising. I thought it was going to kind of be more the opposite, where it would continue. Because Isla Faust, it kind of centered around her in Rogue Nation. And then it didn't center around her as much in Fallout, but she was still in it. And this one feels like they took kind of a similar storyline from Rogue Nation, but this time made Haley Atwell the center of it. And then, of course, it's the Faust, Rebecca Ferguson's character, does die in this movie. And I was genuinely sad, but I could kind of tell that that was going to happen as soon as when the, um, you know, the main villain guy who's working with the AI, when he's fighting, when he's fighting Haley Atwell's character on the bridge, and he's like about to beat her, and then as the Faust comes up with the sword, at that moment I knew she's not going to win this fight. I knew that she was going to die, partly because it's named Part 1, um, and I honestly don't think he needed to name it Dead Reckoning Part 1. I think he just could have named it Dead Reckoning. Uh, but anyway, um, I knew from that point that, yeah, she was going to die. And I knew that because, again, just based upon the way the whole movie had set it up, most of the movie was dominated by Haley Atwell, and we could tell this was just kind of a movie that was going to send Rebecca Ferguson off. And so I'm not sure exactly why Christopher McQuarrie decided to kill off her character when he's about to create, like, release the finale um, for Mission Impossible, which is going to apparently be the last Mission Impossible movie. Um, I guess, again, he wanted to center it more on Haley Atwell. And she's a fantastic, fantastic actress. Um, I think. Even in this movie, like, I think I would have preferred for her to be a little more, I guess I'm used to her playing Agent Carter because I love Agent Carter, watch that TV show a lot. And she's very in control of the whole situation, very much so an agent, very much so, you know, I've got this. And in Mission Impossible, it's hard to explain, but she's playing something completely different. She is playing a thief that is way out of her head, way out of her depth. And so she's nervous throughout the movie. She's scared, anxious, unsure of herself. And so it feels a little weird because that's very opposite from Agent Carter. But to watch Haley Atwell be able to do it so well, just again, further establishes how good of an actress she really is and how much she was wasted in Multiverse of Madness. So I'm glad she got a chance to do something again with Mission Impossible. But anyway, moving back to um, the storyline. Um, it even didn't really feel like that much of a cliffhanger. Like, Beyond the Spider-Verse was a complete cliff... Across the Spider-Verse was a complete cliffhanger. Complete. We have no idea what's going to happen. In this one, it felt more like a pause in the storyline. So, like, I don't really think he needed to name this one Part 1 and the next one Part 2. I think it would have been just fine naming this one Dead Reckoning and then just having the next one. Um, but overall, it was a great movie. Um, it's definitely got to be my favorite out of all the Mission Impossible franchises. I'm looking forward to see where it goes next. And I was genuinely sad to see Isla Faust die. I mean, she's done a lot for Ethan Hunt and his entire team. Um, I'm hoping that Simon Pegg doesn't die, his character doesn't die, because that would, oh, that would crush us. But, um, I think seeing her die, he needed that to kind of twist Ethan Hunt's character into more of a rage. And again, the entire movie, you could tell he's trying to pull Atwell and Cruz together for this movie because um, they were literally chained together for most of the movie. Um, so again, watching him fight an AI is a very interesting villain, and especially nowadays because now AI is threatening to take over everything, I guess, in the industry. Um, so very interesting to have. Like a lot of movies have done AIs as the villain, artificial intelligence as a villain before. It's nothing new. But we haven't seen AI explode like this since 2023. So this was a very adept movie. And I honestly think, I don't think he knew the industry of, because like AI is affecting every industry. Writing, it's the whole reason for the writer's strike. Um, pretty much, because they don't want producers using AI. And they are. Like chat GPT. All this AI technology is coming out, and it's coming out this year. You know, AI technology for music plugins and stuff like that. It's all happening this year. And so I think if Christian McQuarrie had, um, I don't know, I like they were able to do some press with it. If he had led into that a little bit more, because when the previews, 
you don't really know what the villain is. You don't really know that it's AI. You, you have no idea, honestly. And it creates a good reveal. But at the same time, if you had, if Christian McQuarrie was able to like lean into that a little bit more, this movie would have been a lot more successful if people realized what it was about, because it's actually about what everyone is talking about. AI going rogue and being evil. So yeah, kind of an interesting thought process there. But anyway, that is how I, that's my review of all the Mission Impossible movies. Um, just to recapture, at number seven, we have Mission Impossible 2. Number six, we have Ghost Protocol. Number five, we have the first Mission Impossible. Uh, number four, we have Rogue Nation. Number three, we have Mission Impossible 3. And number two is Fallout. And number one for me is Dead Reckoning. So let me guys know what you think. Um, you can drop them in the comments or take a poll. What's the best Mission Impossible movie for you? And um, until next time, Blurds.